It's best to think of a black hole as not an object so much as a region of space-time, okay? It's a region with the property, at least in classical general relativity, quantum mechanics makes everything harder, but let's imagine we're being classical for the moment. It's a region of space-time with the property that if you enter, you can't leave. Literally, the equivalent of escaping a black hole would be moving faster than the speed of light. They're both precisely equally difficult. You would have to move faster than the speed of light to escape from the black hole. So once you're in, that's fine. You know, in principle, uh, you don't even notice when you cross the event horizon, as we call it. The event horizon is that point of no return, where once you're inside, you can't leave. But meanwhile, the space-time is sort of collapsing around you uh, to ultimately a singularity in your future, which means that the gravitational forces are so strong, they tear your body apart um, and you will die in a finite amount of time. The time it takes, if the, if the black hole is about the mass of the sun, to go from the event horizon to the singularity takes about one millionth of a second. According to classical general relativity, the information that makes up you when you fall into the black hole is lost to the outside world. It's there, it's inside the black hole, but we can't get it anymore. In the 1970s, Stephen Hawking comes along and points out that black holes radiate. They give off photons and other particles to the universe around them, and as they radiate, they lose mass, and eventually they evaporate, they disappear. So once that happens, I can no longer say the information about you or a book that I threw in the black hole or whatever is still there, is hidden behind the black hole, because the black hole has gone away. So either that information is destroyed, like you said, or it is somehow transferred to the radiation that is coming out, to the Hawking radiation. There's a supermassive black hole at the center of every galaxy. Yeah. yeah but there's think. also other black holes that aren't necessarily in the center of galaxies. Yeah, so these little ones, well, little, you know, little. <laughs> the, um, the, 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 a few times the mass of the sun, and they're from collapsed stars. So they are stars at the end of their life very bigger than the sun, more massive than the sun, but they run out of their fuel and they start to collapse because gravity squashes them. And if they're sufficiently massive, then there's nothing that can stop the collapse. And so they collapse, as far as we know, to a point, right? And essentially an infinitely dense point. We don't really know what happens at the, well, we don't know what happens right in the middle, but they collapse to such an extent that there's a region around it where from which light can't escape and that's a so nothing can escape and that that's a black hole and what happens to them do they travel are they moving through space yeah they 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 they're still stars right. uh, you know so they they're still there um they they're surrounded this region where if you fall in it's called the event horizon and if you go across that horizon then you are going to the center there's one way of thinking about it which is quite cool which is that uh, the time and space sort of flip is one way to think about it. So in the same way that we are going into the future now, so, so we're going to tomorrow. There's nothing we can do about it. We are going to tomorrow. Um, in the same way, if you fall in across the event horizon of a black hole, you are going to the middle, the singularity it's called. So that's, that's your future. Every, every line of your future points to the center of the black hole. So it's kind of the ultimate of no escape the ultimate prison you're going to get squashed to an infinitely dense so n point not basically. every star becomes a black hole at the end of its life no because if, if um something like the sun um we have a small star it's quite small yeah and, and when it collapses there's a there's a, a a sort of a pressure a force if you like which is caused by the fact that electrons don't like to be very close to each other so it's called the Pauli exclusion principle. But essentially what happens is that, so as they get squashed closer and closer together, they move faster and faster to sort of get out of each other's way, if you like. And that makes a force which holds them up. And so that creates what's called a white dwarf star. So, so you can have a blob of matter. They're about the size of the Earth, but they're about the mass of the sun. And uh, so that's, that's for smaller stars. They end up as these white dwarf things, which are very dense objects. There's another version, which is called a neutron star, which is the same thing, but for neutrons. And they, they move faster and faster. So the, if, it's, if it's massive enough that it overwhelms the electron thing, then the electrons sort of fall, crush into protons and turn into neutrons, and the whole thing starts again. And so a neutron star can be 
you know, at least one and a half times the mass of the sun, let's say. But it can be about, what, 10 miles across? <laughs> so, so that's an incredibly dense ball of matter held up by this, the neutrons moving around. It's got a fancy name, it's called neutron degeneracy pressure, but that's what it is. But if you go even bigger, then even that can't hold it up. And as far as we know then, there's no known force that we know of that can hold, hold the thing up. If it's, if it's too massive. And so that's when it just w almost winks out of existence, if you like. Oh, it, it collapses and collapses and collapses. Um, and that's when you get a black hole. Some of them, they're detached from galaxies, right? They can be. I mean, oftentimes people think about black holes as these gargantuan structures that form from collapsed stars. There's a big one in the center of our Milky Way galaxy, it weighs four million times that of the sun. The photograph of a black hole in the galaxy M87 that got the world excited a couple of years back, 55 million light years away, billions of times the mass of the sun. But the reality is anything, if you compress it enough, becomes a black hole. If you take an orange and you squash an orange down sufficiently small, according to Einstein, it becomes a black hole. So these things don't have to be gargantuan. The flip side of it is we also typically have an intuition that black holes are really dense, right? That's usually the way we think about them. But if you make something sufficiently large, regardless of how low its density is, it will also become a black hole. So you can make a black hole out of air by just having enough air. If you have enough air, sufficiently large sphere of air, it would become a black hole too with the density of air. So all the intuitions that we typically have about black holes, that they have to be dense and they have to be gargantuan, not right. So black holes are just a part of the elemental structure of reality itself. Yeah, when you look at Einstein's equations, right in his mathematics, there's a little formula that you can see where it says, if you have any mass M, whatever mass you want, and you squeeze it into a radius R, that's less than two times Newton's constant, 2g times m divided by c squared, speed of light squared, a formula, details don't matter. But you take any mass, if the radius within which that mass sits is less than 2gm over c squared, it is a black hole, period, end of story, according to Einstein. Now, Einstein left out quantum mechanics. Weirdly, right? Because his Nobel Prize was for quantum mechanics. It was for a paper he wrote in 1905 about the photoelectric effect, but he never, really believed that quantum mechanics was the true description of the world. And when he was developing the general theory of relativity, he was just thinking about gravity and not quantum mechanics. Stephen Hawking came along in 1974 and started to inject quantum mechanics into our understanding of things like black holes. And that's where Hawking proved that black holes are not completely black. He showed that black holes allow a certain amount of radiation to leak out of their surface, leak out of the event horizon, or leak out from just beyond the edge of the event horizon. And so, yes, when you think about black holes, as far as we can tell, they are a fundamental quality of the world, but you have to include quantum physics to truly understand them, and that's the cutting edge of what's happening right now. Black holes are really fascinating objects. They're at the inter interface between quantum mechanics and gravity, and so they help us test all sorts of ideas. Um, I think that, you know, for many decades now, there's been sort of this black hole information paradox that things that fall into the black hole seem to, we've seem to have lost their information. Now I think there's this uh, firewall paradox that has been allegedly resolved in recent years by, um, you know, a uh, former peer of mine, uh, who's now a professor at Berkeley. Um, and uh, there, it seems like there is, as information falls into a black hole, it's sort of, there's sort of a sedimentation, right? As you, as you get closer and closer to the horizon from the point of view, the observer on the outside, the object slows down infinitely as it gets closer and closer. And so everything that is falling to a black hole from our perspective gets sort of sedimented and tacked on to the near horizon. And at some point it gets so close to the horizon, it's in the proximity or the scale which in which quantum effects and quantum fluctuations matter. And there some that in falling matter could interfere with sort of the traditional pictures that it could interfere with the creation and annihilation of particles and antiparticles in the vacuum. And 
through this interference, uh, one of the particles gets entangled with the infalling information, and one of them is now free and escapes. And that's how there's sort of mutual information between the outgoing radiation and the infalling matter. Uh, but getting that calculation right, I think we're only just starting to uh, put the pieces together. Einstein's theory, extended by people like Roger Penrose, tells us that um, black holes are, in a sense, rather simple things, basically, because uh, they are um, um, solutions of Einstein's equations. Um, and the thing that was shown in the 1960s by Roger Penrose in particular, um, and by a few other people, was that um, a black hole, when it forms and settles down, is defined just by two quantities, its mass and its spin. So they're actually very standardized objects. It's amazing that objects as standardized as that um, can be so big and can lurk in the rest of the solar system. Uh, and so that's the situation. holes weighing about 10 or up to 50 times as much as the sun, which are the remnants of, of stars. They were detected first 50 years ago when a black hole was orbiting around another star and grabbing material from the other star which swirled into it and gave us x-rays. So the x-ray astronomers found these um, uh, uh, objects orbiting around an ordinary star and emitting X-ray radiation very intensely, varying on a very short time scale. So something very small and dense was giving that radiation. That was the first evidence for black holes. Um, but then the other thing that happened was realizing that there was a different class of monster black holes in the centers of galaxies, and um, uh, these are responsible for what's called quasars, which is when uh, um, something in the center of a galaxy 
is grabbing some fuel and outshines all the hundred billion stars or so in the rest of the galaxy. A giant beam yeah, and of in, in, light. And in many cases, it's a, be, it's a, be, it's a beam. Is, of, is that, a, yeah. that's got to be the most epic thing the universe produces is quasars. Um, well, it's a, it's a debate of what's the most epic, but uh, qua- quasars maybe, or maybe gamma ray bursts or something. But, but they're, they are remarkable, and they were a mystery for a long time. And they're one of the things I worked on in my uh, younger days. So um, even though they're so bright, they're still a mystery. And what, what, can well, you, I, I wouldn't you say can only see them. I think they're less of a mystery now. I think we do understand basically what's going on. How, how were quasars discovered? Well, they, they were discovered when astronomers found things that looked like stars and that they were small enough to be a point-like, not resolved by a telescope, but uh, uh, outshone an entire galaxy. Yeah, and uh, that's it, suspicious. It, yes, but, but, <laughs> but, uh, um, but then they, they realized that what they were, they were um, uh, uh, objects which you now know are black holes, and they were... Um, uh, uh, black holes were capturing gas, and that gas was getting very hot, but it was producing um, far more energy than all the stars added together. And it was the energy of the uh, black hole that was um, lighting up all the gas in the galaxy, so you've got a spectrum of it uh, there. So, so th- th- this was something which was realized from the 1970s onwards. Um, and uh, as you say, the other thing we've learned is that they often do produce these jets squirting out, um, which could be detected in uh, in all wave bands. So, um, th- so there's, there's now a, a picture. Yeah. Black hole generating jets of light yeah, yeah. at the center of most galaxies. Yes, that's right. Do we know, do we have a sense if every galaxy has one of these big, big boys, well, big uh, black most, holes? Most galaxies have big black holes. They vary in size. The one in our galactic center. Do we know much about ours? We, we do, yes. We, um, we know um, uh, it weighs about as much as four million suns, uh, which is less than some, which are several billion in other galaxies. Um, and we, but we know this um, the one in our galactic center isn't very bright or conspicuous. And that's because not much is falling into it at the moment. If, if a black hole is isolated, then of course it doesn't radiate. It only uh, all that radiates is gas swirling into it, which is very hot or has magnetic it's fields. O- it's only radiating the thing it's murdering or consuming, right. or however you put it. Yeah, that, that, that's right. And so, <laughs> so um, it's thought that our galaxy may have been bright, bright at some time in the past, ah. but now, uh, uh, and that, that's when the, the black hole formed or grew. Um, but but now it's uh, not um, capturing very much gas, and so it's it's rather. It's rather faint and uh, detected indirectly and by fairly weak radio emissions.